Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Looking Deeper with Denise Iwana Francisco and Sandy Herrick. Hey, Sandy. Hey, Dina. How you doing? <laughs> Welcome back. Well, thank you. <laughs> hey, yes. Judy Hoagland. Boy, it's good to see you in the chat room. Hello, Todd Francisco. Hey, Todd. Hey, Judy. Good to see Bobby's you. In... Check in a little later. Aw, very good. So, uh, yeah, I'm back. Hey, Lisa Beldeen, good to see you in the chat room as well. It's good to be back and to be seen. Summer's already been really busy, and it's not even officially summer yet. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I'm in the pool. That's all that counts. <laughs> <laughs> the pool is open, and I'm in it. And that's a good feeling. So what's the weather like up there in New Hampshire? Oh, my God. We're in the 80s. The trees are in full bloom the grass is growing the flowers are starting to come out you know the spring flowers mm -hmm. and the shrubs and whatnot the animals are in their their dire need of being clipped so that's going to happen and as soon as i can get in the pool you know it's like it becomes my haven <laughs> i leave the bathtub and go to the pool <laughs> so tonight you know i was i was in between i had a wonderful busy day today and I was in between just finished a session at four o'clock and I had two hours before my women's group and it was like after and I dragged the hay and the dust and then I mowed the lawn and then it was like well I want to be fresh for tonight so it was like oh I should take a bath and it's like no I'm gonna go for a swim in an outdoor shower <laughs> even better it all works out. yeah it was good. It looks good. You got some color. It looks like you've been to the beach. Well, I was to the beach. I went to the beach on the island of Santorini in Greece uh, last um, week. Nice. Yeah, and it was just absolutely beautiful weather the whole time that we were in Italy and Greece. And uh, so it was good to be out in the sunshine because you know how I like the sunshine. Felt good. Me too. Yeah, yeah. It looks good on you. Thank you. Yeah. So, Sandy, tonight on uh, Looking Deeper, you know, continuing with the theme that we kind of sort of started this year, taking a look at who we really are. And we've talked about who we are after the death of a parent, uh, the death of a loved one, um, our own personal deaths and dying and rebirth. And tonight we decided that we wanted to talk about who are we really with and without our stories. You know, because our lives are made up of stories. Some of them are given to us at birth by, you know, the people that we call parents or guardians, right? They lay a story on us that we're to fulfill, <laughs> right? That does happen. And yeah. then, you know, through the course of living, the story begins to build and sometimes the story continues without change. Right. And sometimes it's continual change to the story. Stories are quite interesting in our lives. So um, I'm hoping that maybe you would be so kind as to do a little centering for us before we go into this topic that, uh, you know, may, may tweak some emotions and some thoughts in people. Perfect. First and foremost, welcome back. Um, I'm glad you had a wonderful trip, and I want to thank you for all the beautiful photographs that everybody sent on Facebook. They gave us the opportunity to take the journey with you. Thank you. I felt very karmically involved, even from afar. Yes. So it was like, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> and it was it was so nostalgic to see those pillars and the artwork and the incredible history that we as human beings really have. Mm -hmm. So talk about making our stories exactly. century after century after century and the landmarks that are the storytellers now. Mm -hmm. So, okay, everybody, take a deep breath. Close your eyes. And it's fascinating. Out in Santa Fe, um, the Native American uh, indigenous storytellers are women. Um, they have tremendous amount of art devoted to the storyteller that is a rotund woman just laden with children sitting on her lap in her arms all around her. And that's the first feeling that I have when we go in tonight to who tells us our story? How does our story become us or we become our story? So imagine, imagine that you are 
in the arms of the great mother. The mother of your creation, not the mother of your blood or your bloodline right now. The mother of your creation, the father of your creation, of your soul, of your essence, of your spirit. The god, the goddess, the source, the resource, the spark that offers you the being to be. And as I inhale, Bobby has graced me with these flowers behind me. We have a bouquet of lilacs and I can smell them. And there's always a story when I smell lilacs. So think about what you are when you smell, when you taste. And know that our stories are the foundation that gives us reference. And they're also the books that need to be thrown into the fire or the mirrors that need to be broken so that we can have our own story and not the story that was told to us. And I'd like you in this moment to be embraced. Embraced by that which is the love of all love. So that you can feel that you are embraced. And that you're safe to tell your story. You're safe to change your story. And you're safe to know the authenticity of who you are. Holy, holy, holy. Sacred, sacred, sacred. Blessed, blessed. Open your eyes when you're ready, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Yeah. That was a beautiful opening. Thank you. Yeah. For me, my life is constant change, and my story seems to always be changing. That is the story of my life, of my experiences, and the story of who I understand myself to be. And I, I think that that's part of the journey of a human lifetime or our earth walk is for our story to morph and to change, but ultimately to grow as we self-realize. How do you feel about that, Sandy? It's, it's so beautifully said the way that you are expressing it because our story, my story, it's interesting how in a therapeutic sense, in a spiritual sense, the story of my spirit, the story of my soul, and the so story of my body is a collaboration. It's, it's really my soul has a story mm -hmm. that is ancient and has many experiences. My spirit has the story of coming into this life and really being quite <coughs> brilliant in the fact that I'm so happy to be here. Yeah. You know, I was lit up. I was a firecracker right away with just, hey, this is great. There are photographs that prove that my story of my inner being, just being so happy to be mm -hmm. there, is the beginning of my story. And I take great pleasure in being able to go back to the reference mm -hmm. of that, to see that my core, I was called Giggly Gert, because I always giggled. I could feel people coming to me. I interacted with everyone from the innocence of the story of my initial experience of being alive mm -hmm. and seeing, just participating. And then the story of my body having a family of origin, my mother, my father, my siblings, what happened to me, that happened to my body. That mm -hmm. happened to me as Sandy growing up that affected my spirit and certainly imprinted my soul. Mm -hmm. And being a therapist, it's so important to listen to the stories that we're working out, kind of complicate us from being able to understand our own intimate story of 
this is who I think I am, this is who I feel I am, but this is who I was told I am, and this is what I was made to be. And now I'm trying to tell the story. So how I feel about it is the wowza effect of how important our stories are. Yes. So that we can explain and clarify and discover mm -hmm. constantly mm -hmm. at any given time, any given moment from any part of our history. Yes. And I love, like you going to Europe, knowing now your ancestry, mm -hmm. that you have a whole new storyline mm -hmm. that validates that inner story that you knew you had, but you were told you didn't have. Exactly. Yes. You know, there was a very poignant moment for me on the island of Mykonos. We had just come from exploring the ruins at Delos. And as much of a history nerd as I am, and I am a history nerd, um, I did not know that Queen Cleopatra had a home on Delos, that there were temples to Isis and Anubis, in and amongst, of course, the temples to Apollo and um, Aphrodite and, and all of those wonderful things. So that was just a brilliant moment for me. But later in the day, Todd and I were at a jewelry store on the island and we were sitting with a lovely young woman and she and I began a conversation about Delos and I said you know I didn't realize that Queen Cleopatra had a home on Delos and she said well the vast majority of what went on in this region of course at that time was trade and it was a wonderful shipping way for merchants to come through and many of the people that came were Egyptian, North African. And she looked at me and she said, are you Egyptian? And it was the first time in my life where I could, you know, look at somebody directly and say, well, as a matter of fact, I am. And she looked at me and she said, well, you know, Queen Cleopatra also had green eyes like yours. And she looked at me and she said, Denise, isn't it amazing how our blood knows where we're from and how our blood desires to be on the land that yeah. we are from? And that's true. And yeah. in this day, you know, we are made up of so many different soils and so many different lands. But by golly, we can feel it in our own personal story that courses through our blood. Yeah. 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 I think it's beautiful that the Ancestry.com, the, um, all these different uh, uh, DNA tests and Ancestry tests, I want to make reference to the commercial that's online for our on TV, for the guy that stands there with Peter Hosen, and he's doing his German dance, and he goes, I always thought I came from da 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 and then he does the Ancestry.com, and he finds out he's Scottish, and he puts on his kilt. I'll exactly. be God dang, if he doesn't look more authentic in a kilt, then he did in his leader posing. <laughs> exactly. And it's just amazing how, yeah, that when we put on the tribal artifacts of our blood, of our DNA, we wear our story well. Yes. And everything else is kind of a costume, mm -hmm. but that's our, I mean, that's our badge. Mm -hmm. That's our tribal wear. Right. And it's it's just so beautiful to know that you know Bobby has some Scottish blood in him, and it's just so beautiful to see that when he he was he had a kilt made for him out of all sorts of things, and when he put it on, there was something natural about him. And when he puts on his uh, a, a shirt like this and puts a vest on and his ponytail, it's like <laughs> damn, baby. He looks. He's not a man born from Miami, mm -hmm. and they call it Miami from down there. Uh -huh. He's a man from the Isle. Yeah, you know mm -hmm. he, and you can tell that his bloodline mm -hmm. has that Englishman, that Scottish, that something, and a pirate. So, so there's that um, authenticity when all of a sudden we wear mm -hmm. what fits. If I were to put on. African American clothes, I could probably wear them because I have that feeling of being African American. Mm -hmm. But it would not be as beautiful mm -hmm. 
as when an African American, uh, when an African woman puts on those outrageous colors and all that, other, and moves in that mm-hmm. femininity, because the authenticity mm-hmm. of the story of their discovering how to wear who they are, yes, emulate yes. who you are. Yes. There are photographs of you in in. Um, no, I'm gonna say Egypt, and it's funny that that's like in in uh, Greece, where that Egyptian, all these, you know, there the artifacts and everything else around you. Your identity oozed out of you, and I made mention of it to you today. Your sensuality as a female was so robust mm-hmm. that there's that beauty of there's no holding back who you are mm-hmm. when you're in your element. It exposes you. You don't have to expose yourself. It exposes you. Thank you. You know, you're 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 in the garden you belong in. Thank you. Well, and I think that that's true when we find ourselves with with people in our soul family. The story that we are, the story that we wear, the story that's inside of us that's metaphysical or spiritual. And we find ourselves in groups of those sorts of of people, of like mind, of like consciousness, all of a sudden as well, um, we find ourselves feeling more full, more accomplished, more realized. And there are times when we step into past lives that we feel very uh, comfortable and familiar. And Lady Hawk, thank you for the, the comment. I was with Mystic Travels of course, in Italy and Greece for two weeks with an amazing group of people, astounding group of beautiful souls. And Lady Hawk, you'll appreciate this. When I got back, there was a report waiting for me on 23andMe that most of my relatives here in the United States, my blood relatives, you know, because this is news to me, of course, uh, live in the great state of Texas. (laughs) So... Very few of my relatives live above the Mason-Dixon. Most of them actually live in Texas. So I got, a, I got a big kick out of that. How we connect with sometimes unconsciously or subconsciously uh, with people and feelings and, you know, that bring us to the truth of our story. There are so many people I feel... <laughs> Um, are told what their story is going to be from a very young age. Sandy, you ever met anybody like that who was told what their story was going to be or, or what it should be? Well, I think anybody and anybody can just look in the mirror, including me, with, you know, mm-hmm. I look in the mirror and my story was, you look just like your father. You must be Richard Herrick's daughter. Uh-huh. You are a Herrick. You're a Herrick. Mm-hmm. And then my mother would say, well, you're a Herrick. And it... it it's away from being a Petersburg, which was her bloodline. Oh. And so my story, by being a Herrick and being told I'm a Herrick, which I do, I look like my father. But then all of a sudden, interestingly enough, there are photographs of my mother's family, mm. which is, you know, the, the, the turn of the century where people are all, all buttoned up and you know, all these people. Mm-hmm. And my brother Robbie looks so much like my mother's side of the family wow. that it's staggering because he looks just like my father. And and the storyline is and here there you know, we'll go deeper. Being told I'm a Herrick means then I belong to the story of my father and my father's people that my mother addressed shame to. Ooh. Wow. And being a Herrick meant that I belonged to a group of people that were hard workers, blue collar workers, but they were not an educated family. They weren't educated people. And so so this is, we're going into the shadow now. And this is yeah. not to make anybody right or wrong, right. no good, no bad, no evil, no poor me, no whining. Mm-hmm. This is to allow the ownership <clears throat> of how, when we're told about our story or told a story about us, mm-hmm. that when we don't have a self-edit, 
that we believe the story we're told. And then we start to wear the shame or the claim or the fame of our story. And does our story make us who we are? Or do we have to break the story to become who we are? And it's really beautiful to know that my mother's bloodline in her father, he was a um, very sensitive person, very gifted, very emotionally intelligent, intelligent, a pianist and whatnot, highly, highly, highly regarded. And it's fascinating that we were never told we were like a peeper's bird. Oh. Wow. And yet, exactly. But as soon as I got into metaphysics, the one and only person of my bloodline that came to me was my gra- grandfather, mm. Herman Petersburg, who gave me the story of my spirituality in mysticism. Wow. And so it's interesting how my grandfather brought me the story of his and my lineage. When going, I am riveted with energy. And what that says to me, like as in you, that the mysticism inside me came to claim my story or tell me my story. So it wasn't just given to me somebody who had opinions or some um, angst Mm -hmm. about Herrick's. Right. And so I was able to get another storyline and my mysticism is aligned with something. And even though my father is very, very psychic, I started to homogenize. And that's an interesting word because my father was in the milk business, homogenized milk. I became homogenated with my human story is one thing. My spiritual story is something else. And the beauty of my grandfather coming to me, telling me my story meant spirit did not want to invalidate me with my humanness. It wanted to incorporate me with my spirit and my humanness. Yeah. It's well, fascinating just... the, the way that this conversation is going regarding the story as it originates from our family. Carla Jo is saying people look at her and say, you must be a worth, <laughs> you know? And Cindy Lynn is saying, and for heaven's sakes, don't ruin or tarnish the family name. Don't ever do that. And Lisa well, Bell- I did. We'll get to that. <laughs> Lisa Baldina is saying, I physically resemble both of my parents, but deep down never felt in alignment with any of my family except her mom. And now that right. her mom, God bless her, has passed on, Lisa feels very um, disconnected from them. So in that, well, there's a change in the story. Absolutely. Because all of a sudden when... You know, both of my parents have passed away, and when my mother passed away, there was a the end of the story right. of being my mother's and my father's child. Yes. When my father passed away, he passed away 27 years ago, and my mother passed away a year ago, January, and all of a sudden the story changed because <clears throat> my parents were no longer here mm-hmm. for me to say or rely on that I belong to someone. Mm. I needed to belong to me Mm -hmm. and to my siblings. In what way? There are siblings I don't belong to. I share my blood with them. Right. But I don't belong to them anymore. Right. They're no story of my future. They're very much a part of the story of my past. Mm. And they weave into the story of my presence. And we'll see how it goes about the story of my my future. And so, therefore, I think it's very important to say that sometimes our family of origin does not go through our whole lives as our story. We need to break away from the story. That's big. To make peace with that, to make peace with that, Mm -hmm. is to make peace with... Who am I? Who do I belong to? Right, and that's big. Am I, do I only exist if I belong to someone? Mm-hmm. Right. And your that's hubby... Old, that's what show it is. <laughs> uh, your hubby is saying... Bobby, that, Bobby, yeah, Bobby. 
he's in he is he both of our hubs are in the in the room um <clears throat> and making the comment but Bobby, the story goes on me, Bobby. <laughs> the story <laughs> continues on you know whether we're participating in that story or or not that story continues on and it is changing holly is saying that's a painful fact for me to accept it feels like a body rejecting an organ so boy wow. when we, yeah well, well i didn't said. i yeah i didn't know our our show was going to take this uh, particular venue but thank you all for participating in the conversation and for Absolutely. those of you that would care to share to like and share the show that would be fantastic um, I want to go to Holly because Holly, you're right. Our siblings are appendages. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we lean on them. I'm the second oldest of seven children. And I want to honor my sister Carol right now, the oldest child, because she became, the her story became, mm -hmm. she became the surrogate mother. Because mm -hmm. my mother, having seven children, um, she was fragile, there was all sorts of things, and whenever my mother was overwhelmed, Carol literally got picked up from school, brought home, to take care of the children. Oh, wow. And so she became the mother to these children without being labeled the mother. Mm. And I did not have children because I felt very, very clear that I already fed babies, changed babies. There was nothing in my DNA to that needed to have a baby because I had so many babies being the second of seven. That means I brought up five kids. Wow. And the honor of knowing that the story of my family is huge. Mm. The story of me is big because I had to break away from a huge story of a family. And it's like, you know, when a firework goes up, you see the one great big line of energy and then it mm -hmm. bursts and it blows out. Mm -hmm. That's what happens with families sometimes. Mm -hmm. I know it's happened to your family. Definitely. I mean, and, and how many families? My birth family, you know, the family of foster parents, the family that first adopted me, the family that adopted me second. And... <clears throat> My my family out on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, you know, who I love absolutely dearly. It's my soul family and right. uh, my family of friends. I've learned in my life that my story, my story is not dependent on origin. It's dependent on the movement of me and my life. And, you know, my dad, the Sarge, taught me at a very young age, <clears throat> a very young age, that family is not necessarily determined by blood. Well, as an adopted <laughs> child, how wise of him to be able to support you with that information. Absolutely, and he was right. And, you know, and my father, because he did want children, he couldn't have children. He wanted children so desperately, he nearly adopted children from Korea, Vietnam, while he served in both of those places. And lo and behold, you know, when he comes back stateside after Korea, he finds out that there's a little girl available in Memphis, Tennessee. That'd be me. And so his idea of being a father or being a child was not based on, on bloodline. And who he enveloped as his family, you know, you know my friend Darlene, right? And my friend Kelly, and they were daughters number two to, the, to him. And he would say, okay, daughter number two. Okay, daughter number two. And he meant that. Right. He meant that. Um, but there are stories that we assume as adopted people. This past weekend, I was having a great conversation with David Sturkin, who's also adopted. And for those of I, us that are adopted, <laughs> yeah, who doesn't love David Sturkin, right? Cat is amazing. Um, but as an adopted person, it's called the adoption Kool-Aid. And yeah. yeah, and it is a sticky wicket to talk about as an adopted person about the Kool-Aid. And he and I got into a very deep philosophical discussion about being adopted and the Kool-Aid or the story that we are made to participate in and continue. 
And, right. you know, the, the onus or the basis of the, the, the Kool-Aid as an adopted person is that we are to feel grateful to the people who adopt us. And it doesn't matter what the circumstances of the family is, if they beat you, if they mistreat you, blah, blah, but you should still be grateful. And by the way, not only should you be grateful, but you were chosen. It's part of the story. It's part of the mantle that all adopted children are informed of at one point or another. And me talking about this tonight is, is really what started a huge um, explosion within my adopted family was me being real about what it means to be raised in a family not of the origin because you don't participate in certain parts of the story because those parts of the story are, are not yours to participate in. I want to be able to describe to you what I'm surrendering my body to feel right now because I don't want to resist it. There is a swell of heat moving through me. <clears throat> There's almost a suffocation mm -hmm. and a heat on my body mm -hmm. as you tell your story. Mm. And I want to say this to David also, so I hope you see this, David. It's as if hearing your story, when someone claims you or buys you yes. or brings you in because their desire to have mm -hmm. means that they think you or your hand delivered, they yes. don't have you. Yes. Then their projection of their need of you becomes their claim of parent. Yes. They get to be a parent. Because you provide them with the identity of being a parent. Yes. And as you provide somebody with the identity of being a parent, you are also denied the identity of being a child to a parent. Yes. Yes. And it, it, it's giving me that suffocation of, the air, whose air do you breathe? Do you breathe your mm -hmm. air, the air of your mm -hmm. core family, of the family that tries you out, the family that finally says, I want, therefore mm -hmm. you are entitled? And as a child who is born to the people who had sex and conceived me, mm -hmm. I would like to say, This is very wild as I'm feeling yeah. it. Even in conception, there is a perception about what we're supposed to be mm -hmm. when we're delivered. Absolutely. Yes. And, you know, when you're... And there... Go ahead. When you're trying to fit into the well, story, any one of us, at some point in our lives, we try to fit into the story. Exactly. Who I am as mm -hmm. Sandy is different than who I am as Sandy Herrick. And it's fascinating because when I got married, and you have name identities. When I was married, I became Sandy Mudgett. And that never rang true as my name. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean I didn't love John Mudgett. It meant my mother's story, and that was going back to the beginning of our, our show, my mother's shame that I was living with someone in 1969, oh. rather than being married mm -hmm. in my own apartment, 21 years old, free white, 21, 1966, living with someone from Vietnam, mm -hmm. and she says, you will not shame my name. Oh my. By being unmarried. Mm -hmm. I got married. So the story was, if I want a family, I had to get married and take on another identity. Mm. Rather than be comfortable and allowed to be in the identity I was experiencing. Right. And taking on that identity, taking on her story, 
and I say this to John Mudgett with all the respect and love in the world. Mm -hmm. I asked him, standing next to a Chevy, <laughs> or maybe it was a was it was a Pontiac, I, and and it was it was one of those great stories of my mother wants us to get married, and well, we're kind of getting on. Do you want to get married? And he went, well, why not? Hmm. We loved each other, but we were not in love with mm -hmm. each other. And the story became, we needed to fulfill my mother's story, not to be shamed. Mm -hmm. And we tried to do something to give my mother a story. Mm -hmm. And our story mm -hmm. then became pain. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for us to start looking at whose story are we, are we trying to fulfill? Mm -hmm. And certainly as an adopted child, you're trying to fulfill fill mm -hmm. the story of the people who desire to have a story that says I'm a parent right right well it was very poignant for me upon my high school graduation uh, one of my aunties gave me a watch that belonged to my adoptive grandmother and the weekend of my high school graduation we had a family reunion or a gathering uh, down at Lake Orion here in Michigan at my aunt's place. And I woke up in the morning to my cousins and my aunts outside my bedroom door having a conversation. And the conversation went something like this. Why on earth did you give her grandma's gold watch? She's not even one of us. She doesn't deserve to have that watch. And me being me, you know, I woke up and I took the watch off because I wore it while I was sleeping and I handed it back. And they all, of course, were horrified that I had heard the conversation. And they didn't know what to say. And all I said was, you know, I'm sorry that, you know, this was gifted to someone that you, you feel doesn't deserve it or isn't in um, alignment with having it. So please take doesn't it back. Sorry, doesn't belong to the story. Doesn't belong to the story. So please have it back. And in that moment, because it's so poignant in my memory, <clears throat> one of the last times that I talked to my dad, he and I talked about that, that episode. And it was, it was very poignant for me that that wasn't my story. Right. And so the search began for, but what is my story now? And who am I living my story for? Some of us live our story for family, for friends, for spouses, for jobs. How many people hand their life and their story over for a job that makes them absolutely miserable and yet it becomes their story along with the misery that it provides? And so it was, I remember very vividly thinking to myself, from here on out, I'm going to search for people, places, and things that resonate with my soul. That's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was telling you earlier I, today about an, uh, something that happened at a CZ. Yes. We were at a CZ, uh, actually, we're in Laverna, which is the place where St. Francis of Assisi received the stigmata, the markings of the crucifixion of Christ. And we had a beautiful guide. Her name was Sister Angela Rose from Germany. She was German, uh, but and just gentle and a beautiful soul. And here are 27 of oh, us. I just, oh. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Say it again because I just lost you. There was a bleep in the screen. Okay, her name was Sister Angela Rose. And she was a poor Claire. You know, St. Francis had, of course, the Franciscans and his best friend, was uh, Claire, and so the poor Claires, you know, followed uh, Sister Claire. So Sister Angela Rose is a poor Claire, and she's there at this magnificent place of peacefulness where St. Francis of Assisi lived out the rest of his life. And at one point, she made a comment about the fact that the name of my travel group is Mystic Travels. And a couple of ladies kind of chuckled, and Sister Angela looked at them and said, why are you chuckling? Mystics and mysticism are beautiful. And what I'm about to tell you during the course of our tour, I wouldn't tell to any other tour group unless they were named something like mystic travelers. 
And she went on to say something that was so beautiful. She said, you know, before we're ever even born, we're given a dream. And the dream that we are given by our creator is planted in our heart. It's planted in our soul. And our soul knows the dream. And as we're living our life, we can either live the dream that creator gave us and put in our soul or not. And we all know that when we don't follow the dream that our soul has for our life on earth, life becomes miserable. And no matter what that dream is, when we follow the dream of our soul, our life becomes peaceful and meaningful and full of joy. And we all just sat there with our mouths dropped, especially people who were not Catholic, who had preconceived notions about Catholicism or those that, you know, had bad experiences with Catholicism because here's this woman saying, you've been given a dream, go live your dream. Walk your story. Um, right. I want to validate that. And, and, and um, there's an echo. When I was in the school of um, horsemanship with Klaus Ferdinand Hempley, mm. the first slide that he put up on the first school that he was teaching about horsemanship Mm -hmm. was of a beautiful black woman, all in white, holding the symbol of a white horse. And he said that the horse came from the dream of an <laughs> African consciousness. And it was voodoo, not voodoo, the story that it became, right. but the voodoo in the beauty of the mother. Mm-hmm. And when I saw that, my story quickened because I thought that makes so much sense. I have had two white horses. I dreamed of horses. And to think that horses were a dream that comes true mm -hmm. from some rich African consciousness, mm -hmm. from a beautiful woman or man of great origin mm -hmm. originality right that from god makes me want to cry mm -hmm. to make a dream come true and i just had a dream of silver and razzle it's amazing and my mother that when we dream the stories of that depth of our unconscious that mm -hmm. says Dream the dream that brings you the freedom to be who you are. Yes. And to dream the dream and be allowed to know that a dream is a story telling you the story that mm -hmm. contradicts the story that you were told mm -hmm. by the humans because it's our subconscious story remembering itself. Right. Right. And... I want to be able to say that your trip over the past two and a half weeks filtered through my dream cycle mm -hmm. and how wonderful and generous and gracious that for you to walk with the people, some of them I know, to walk on such ancient dust mm -hmm. to react a dream of that once was reality mm -hmm. and everyday existence. Yeah. So are my dreams reminding me of who I am mm -hmm. or bringing me <laughs> to the point of you need to remember of where you were, where you are, and where you're going? Right. Yes. And my story is bigger than this life. Absolutely. All of our stories are bigger than this life. Yes. And, you know, you and I texted each other throughout your trip very gently, very, very spontaneous. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful to talk to you and say, I texted you as you were standing at the Coliseum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Literally. Knowing that, <laughs> yeah, that, you know, I'm, I'm honoring, well, I was there with you. Um, my, our, our, my, your, our 
word deep bop bop i want to say this to bobby as he's listening there's so much energy with our story that is coming to a place that says, I would like to start our story mm. and not just be the victims of the stories that brought us up, but the, the, to be able the story that brought us together, right. that makes us who we are and that will bring us into the rest of our lives so that we can listen to our story, that mm -hmm. we can love our story, mm -hmm. and fight for our story. Yeah. Beautiful. Lisa Beldine is saying, you know, if, if it weren't for the hurtful experiences that we have in our lives, would we have remained complacent? Would we have been complacent and um, not had that rub? Well, it's always the friction that causes motion. And so, yeah, absolutely, Lisa, without the friction and, frankly, the grace of the friction that we undergo in our lives, I'm fully aware that at the end of this particular lifetime, when I get to the other side, I'm going to look at all of the people that caused me the greatest rub, the greatest friction, and say, thanks, you did a great job in helping me to fully realize what I came to realize on the earth plane. So you you are the absolutely homing. spot on. Yeah. It's the homing. Absolutely. And, you know, there are so many people that challenge us to think outside of the box, to rethink life. I happen to believe for myself as I was there in, you know, Akrotiri on the island of Santorini, and they're coming to, to really, really understand that perhaps this is truly the, the remains of Atlantis. Uh, archaeologists around the globe are working around the clock at Akrotiri and uncovering things that really are pointing to this being the place of Plato's um, Atlantis. And so you're right, Sandy. At all times, I am a person who believes, and this is just me, that I'm living all of my lifetimes now with the ability to tap in here or to walk through there, have a moment of deja vu over there, or to be standing in the Colosseum in Rome and for the first time in my life feel myself as a female gladiator. I didn't even know there were female gladiators. And yet I'm standing in the middle of the, the Roman Colosseum and I know every nook, I know every cranny, our guide didn't even have to tell me anything about anything because before she said it, my self had already told me. And as I'm standing there thinking, holy, where is this coming from? I receive a text from Sandra Herrick. I know. <laughs> saying, um, I was standing right there with you. I'm standing wherever you are. I'm right there with you. Well, Sandy, as a matter of fact, I'm standing in the Roman Colosseum. And so how magnificent and vast our story is, and I feel as though in, within the confines of our humanity and our human relationships, we are graced with people who give us our wings and they help us maintain our wings throughout the course of a lifetime, and we are graced by people who rub and create the friction that says, oh, my wings have got to bust out. i got to do something different about all of this. And so in either way, I believe we're walking in grace and coming to understand, you know, when do we let go of a part of a story? When do we let go of a story? When it's over, because all stories have an end. There you go. How do you know when a story has ended? Well, several ways. It either walks out of you, your life, mm -hmm. or slams you in the face with, you better pay attention, mm -hmm. or you feel there is no longer a breath mm -hmm. to keep going. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, the end of the story can either take your breath away because someone said, this is no longer giving me air, mm -hmm. and I can no longer <laughs> breathe this air with you, right. and we're shot. Right. And... Or when someone comes and says their story is different than yours now, and they need to be honest in following their own story. Right. Absolutely. And we have to 
feelings about it. When yes. something dies because the story is done mm -hmm. and we don't know that, you know, there, there are so many books I have read or movies I've seen or, or series that I've watched that I can feel the end of the story coming. It's like I grieve mm -hmm. not befriending it yeah. in the ritualistic daily or weekly or monthliness of it. Yeah. And I am not easy when a story is broken from me about it, but I am very rigid when I am breaking a story. Mm. So it depends on if, if I'm done with a story and the story's done, I'm a little chilly. I have to be honest because it's, it's just not there anymore. Right. And I have hurt people's feelings deeply because they still had need of being a part of my story and I was done with that story right. and I have been horrified overwhelmed taken to my knees when someone said yeah my story with you is overdone and out and see if and I'm left with my fantasy of the story mm. or my desire for the story to continue because I don't know who I will be without that story And I have to create another story right. or find the story that's next. Right. It has always happened, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean I didn't grieve or that I was confused as to why a story would end without me knowing it coming to it. But there's, there's that intelligence in all of us, and I know you know this too. I have never been gaspy, <gasps> shocked. It's over right. without some forewarning. Yeah. There's that like, mm -hmm. uh, look at the signs, pay yeah. attention. Yeah. But my desire that the story went on was deeper than mm -hmm. my ability to see that the story was fading. Yeah. That ready, you've got another chapter, maybe two, maybe three. Right. And I think it's important that we start taking responsibility or looking at when we feel those signs or have those signs that possibly we could become more gentle with ourselves and less mm -hmm. fearful right. that this is the only story that our life will ever have. Oh, I like that. Why? Well, I like that because sometimes, and you know, I think this is true for all of us, that we, we revel in a story or we're ensconced in a story or maybe we've been taught that the story should never change. And all of a sudden you can feel it. I can always feel it creeping up on me. Something right. is changing. Something has shifted. Um, something is no longer amenable or in alignment. And I can you feel it. You have bona fide premonitions and intuition. Absolutely. You and I discussed it today, and today revealed itself. Well, exactly. And understanding that our story does change, the story of others changes, that the story should change, we don't have to like it, um, helps us to understand that we're, we're not exclusive to a single story. And Kelly Manson, I love this, Kelly. Some stories Kelly, should have... <laughs> I love this. Some stories should have ended sooner than they did. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. There's a... Um, there's a real deep wisdom here that we're starting to kind of circle around mm -hmm. and that is based on the fact that you have just gone to a very profound karmic experience with a group of people that you shared it with multiple yeah. individuals without mm -hmm. even knowing how many mm -hmm. That we all collectively have gone through the story of your travels mm -hmm. and all been affected by it. And when you and I talked today, I really wanted to make tribute to you took me to places karmically that I didn't need to necessarily go to physically mm -hmm. to have the story activate because it was activated because you were physically there and I was paralleling it with you 
whether I was physically there or not. Thank our you. intuition, our spirit, our soul was traveling together. And so I want to take this moment, and I really truly mean it, Dana, for taking the journey, taking the opportunity, mm -hmm. taking the grace, and taking the hits mm -hmm. of whatever the karmic stories are that had unraveled mm -hmm. while you were there. Mm -hmm that I could experience in the safety of my home, just being here, mm -hmm. but that you and others experienced in going to places that I will be blatant. I'm not soulfully ready yet to go mm -hmm. to because I know the story is so huge. And it doesn't mean I will never go. Mm -hmm. It means I know that I have trepidation about going mm -hmm. because it's not my time to go. I can't go out of desire. Mm -hmm. I need to go out of the fire being lit that would take me there. And, and you'll enjoy this, Sandy, because, you know, before I left, as you know, I have a very dear friend that is walking through a very intense fire with cancer. And every week, every other week, now that since I was gone, I send her a I love you just because greeting card. And in the greeting card, I write to her everything that I love about her and all of the ways that her life has blessed me. So the day before we left for Rome and Greece, she sent me a message and she said, I just got back from spending time with my family. And thank you. And I'm just, I'm wondering, Dana, if you would do me the favor of posting as many videos and as many photos as you possibly can from Italy and Greece, because I know my soul is happy there. And I said, absolutely, I will. And so that's why there was this plethora of videos and photos is because the I love you just because, which I learned from you, and shared it with her, and I continue to share it with her. And somebody said to me, My, you are like on a bender with posting uh, photos and videos. And I said, I'm doing it for a very special person. And hopefully others along the way will enjoy them as well. So the connection as somebody is leaving this lifetime, knowing that being present with the photos and the videos in, in Greece and Italy is easing the transition time. And remembering how many lifetimes are already yes. been lived since then. Yes. Bringing some substantial resolution and... Mm -hmm healing yeah so that in the next lifetime there's already I love you because you exist again yes oh yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 and and I want to say this to your orphan I love you because you exist Plain and simple. Doesn't mean you had to exist through someone. It means you, no matter how you got here, you determined that your dream would exist. Yeah. Thank you, Sandy. I love you too, as you know. And for me, this whole talk about stories. It's kind of the volumes, like a treasure chest of experiences, and our soul is so vast. And I think to myself, what a gift it is when we have people in our lives that gift us with the room for our story to change that gift us with the space and the love to be there as our story is changing. Like with my friend, her story is vastly changing. And she said to me, you know, I'm really at peace for w with where I'm going and I'm still at peace with being in my body. 
thank you for being part of this journey with me. There's a beauty that is very <clears throat> substantial here. And where I want to go with this very sweetly, very tenderly, and very fiercely is we never know when our time is up. That's right. We never know when the story's over. Right. We never know how our story is supposed to really teach us. We find out we're being taught by our story. Mm -hmm. We also know that the story that has been placed upon us can either suffocate us mm -hmm. or be the soil that allows us to bloom. Bingo. Yeah. And we have to be attentive. We can't just assume that everybody loves us mm -hmm. or wants to hear our story. Right. That is a fantasy. Yes. We also have to know that our story is important, but it's not the only story to be told. Yes. And I think it's very important, and you're bringing up so beautifully, what a story needs to be changed is, I'm not my story. Hmm. I'm bigger than my story. Yes. <laughs> and I'm not the story that somebody wants me to stay in. Mm -hmm. I'm the story that I'm about to write. Yes. In a glorious blaze of light across the universal stars throughout the universe yes. and right now we're at that place in our I mean, I'm feeling so much love for you right now it's just really beautiful almost our stories are just beginning yeah. because so much story mm -hmm. has been reasoned with or made peace with mm -hmm. Or finally, therapeutically, energetically, lovingly, metaphysically, however it needs to be transitioned mm -hmm. and shifted, has given us the place of a vacant blank page yeah. to write a new story. Yeah. You're, come on in. Bobby's watching. Oh, hey, Bobby. It's, well, it's me, us and the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> We're still on. <clears throat> When we were on the island of Mykonos and we were getting ready to sail over to the island of Santorini, I was having this great conversation with my friend Bev Borman because Bev got sick during the trip. And, you know, when, you're, when we're processing past lives, experiences, who we are, shedding the stories, embracing the stories, it reminds me of Amantha Murphy talking about the weave. And Bev and I were waiting for the ferry to Santorini to come in. And she said, you know, Dana, I really do feel as though this whole idea of purging and realigning and the fact that I've been, you know, very sick on this trip is that I'm experiencing changes. I'm having my own vision quest. Well, right. if anybody doesn't know they're on a vision quest when they take a journey with you and many uh, are disillusioned. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. And as she said that, a woman walked our way. This woman looked, if I didn't know any better that we were on the island of Mykonos, I would have thought this woman was probably from Guatemala, Nicaragua, a place like that. She was absolutely adorable, cute as a little bug. I could see her from the front. She had on a pink, pink t-shirt that said angel. And she came, and, mm -hmm, she came and she sat on a little pylon right next to me and Todd and Bev and the rest of the group. And on the back of her sweater and on the sleeves of her sweater were spiders. Big, huge, woven into her sweater. Iktomi, grandmother spider. And I, Todd looked at me and I, I looked at her. She was so doggone cute. And Bev continued to say, you know, I feel like I'm really releasing some things from my life and embracing other things. And I said, you mean like the weave, the tapestry of our lives sometimes has to unweave and unravel in order for it to reweave in new ways. And she said, exactly like that. And I said, Bev, Take a look at the sweater on the lady sitting right. And she looked at me and her eyeballs got really big. And in that moment, that sweet little woman who had a duff, black duffel bag three times bigger than her got up from the pylon and she walked off with her duffel bag that was very, very full. 
And Bev said, well, she had spider. It's about the weave. And I said, and her pink t-shirt said angel. Now, for some people, that would just be, wow, how, how sweet that that cute little lady wearing an angel t-shirt and a spider sweater came and sat there at that moment. And when you were done with your conclusion, got up and left. But I felt in my heart that that was a moment of grace. And I, I said to Bev earlier today, Bev, one of the things that I love about you is your ability as a person to walk through a fire, because I've seen her walk through many a fire. I said, you walk through the fire and you're one of the few people that can describe the beauty of the fire as you are walking through it and hold the treasure after you've come through it and you're standing there in your charred remains in a moment of regrowth. And she said to me, thank you so much for saying that to me. And I think that a lot of us experience walking through the fire of change and burning away the old volumes. Not that they really ever go away. They are in the Akasha. Say it again because you just blurbed out. It, you know, I think that our story, yeah, sometimes we have to, you know, burn the volumes. You know, let them go, destroy them. And out of the ashes, like the phoenix. Sandy, for you, when you're having a moment of becoming the phoenix again, how do you pick your oh, stuff? I've got, I've got a Twitter. Go ahead. How I've do you pick? Ahead. How do you pick yourself up by your bootstraps and say, "Okay, we're rising from this story and we're we're being born into a new one"? How do you make that transition for yourself? So I need to be really human in being allowed to acknowledge that I am not gracious when change comes if I don't like the change. Mm. If I like the change, you be I Kaye. If I don't like the change, holy mother. <laughs> and 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 there's that duality of consistent resistance mm -hmm. or insistence that I want change all the time when I'm frustrated mm -hmm. with that life is not as engaged mm -hmm. as I want it to be. That validates or radiates the gift I've been given to be a spiritual person. I also know that when my humanness is in the strangulation of being human by being forced to have to face not everybody wants to be with me not everybody wants to make my life simple mm -hmm. and not everybody agrees with the way that i live right my humanness is suffers <coughs> from why is my humanness so different than others Excuse me. So making peace with it takes time. <coughs> Excuse me. It takes substance. And it takes the processes of realizing we're, nobody's put here just to make your life easy. Right. It's to give you the reality that life, that I'm in that moment right now where I'm walking around saying, I am so grateful for every hardship that I've had that's mm -hmm. given me the life to stay free. Yeah. Because my dream and my barter is about my freedom. And it's amazing to be a free person at how you have to fight with something that says you aren't allowed to be free. You can only obtain who you are by being obedient mm -hmm. and consistent to ritual. Mm -hmm. And my whole life has, be, has been anti-ritualistic to anything that says be obedient to make peace with the fact that I piss people off for being a renegade including myself but I am peaceful with the fact that my renegade and it's interesting one of the first horses that I ever got to ride that was ours was named renegade oh. and I, I got on him Bareback, just bareback, buckskin, uh -huh. 
to know that I knew how to get on a horse without a saddle and a bridle. My goodness, Gesundheit. Without a bridle or a, a saddle, because something inside me knew who I knew. I didn't know what I thought I knew. Mm-hmm. I knew what I knew I knew. Mm-hmm. And I think that's very important. Sometimes we think we know something and we don't. And sometimes we think we don't know something and we do. Yeah. And mm-hmm. only the experience of challenge, challenge the experience, mm-hmm. gives us the opportunity to find out something that brings us the story that becomes who we are, mm-hmm. not what we were told to be right. or had to be. Yes. So I want to thank Renegade <laughs> for giving me the opportunity to say, I'm just going to get on your back and see what happens. Knowing that I knew how to get on a horse and I didn't know I knew how to. Mm. I knew how to because I knew how to. Your soul I didn't need to know how to. <laughs> I need to remember, I need to remember I knew horses. Yeah. So, I need to close the door here. Hang on a second. Oh, God. <laughs> Bobby's sneezing. Listen tight. Aww. Okay. How, how is it for you to come back into the Enchanted Forest, Michigan, um, your everyday life from being on such an excursion, Dana? Um, well, I love the Enchanted Forest. I love being here in the forest, and that's probably uh, due to my Scandinavian roots, right? Uh, but I love the peacefulness. I love peacefulness. Yes. And I love the tranquility of being here in this very peaceful place. Coming back into my life... Um, It's very different for me. You know, one of the stories that I was raised with is the story of Catholicism. And, you know, when we go on adventure, sometimes our stories are challenged. Our beliefs are challenged. And when our beliefs are challenged, it can challenge our balance and change our story. And I had one thought about what it would be like to be at the Vatican. And what happened for me being at the Vatican was vastly different. And it changed my inner dialogue about what the definition is of holy. Just because the story is it's a holy place doesn't mean that it necessarily is. And so I, I've, I've had you know a few days to really think about some of the experiences that I had with regard to the word holy and sacred and interestingly people have asked me what was the most holy place that you visited and you know one of the most holy places i visited was the forest in laverna in italy where francis lived out the remainder of his life in a cave and where he received the stigmata being in that forest in that natural grotto was one of the most sacred experiences I've had because I could feel the love of Francis there and his belief and understanding that everything was alive with the breath of creator, which is what the way I was raised uh, to believe. And so I you know, had to come back and sit back and think to myself, well, you know, what's going to happen when one of my very Catholic friends says to me, so what was it like for you to go to the Vatican? Was it magnificent? Was it holy? It was holy, but it wasn't holy sacred for me. For others, it was very holy and very sacred. For me personally, uh, sacred was outdoors. Very much like, well, I have a St. Francis garden, as you know, uh, in the Enchanted Forest. Um, So I don't even know why I went off on that bender about the Vatican. So maybe it would have been just better if the good Pope Francesco had been there. Because I think he's a pretty cool guy. Well, I want to validate the fact that even the story of the Vatican is so challenged right now. Yeah. And it's been challenged for a while. In the 80s, when I was living in Europe, the Vatican was being exposed as a very diabolical, um, dark 
vehicle for all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. People were being hung on the bridges. It was being exposed for uh, laundering money. It was um, the, the challenge of pedophiles being priests. And so the Vatican as a vehicle for Christianity is one thing. A house for men and women is another thing. And the museum for artifacts throughout time is something else. Mm -hmm. And so the Vatican for me is a, it, and, and it's, it's kind of like DC, you know, here in America. It's a city on to itself. Yes. It's its own, it's its own existence. It doesn't exist with the rest of the world. Right. It has its own existence. And the Vatican, historically, depending upon who the Pope was, was a tyrant mm -hmm. that consumed artifacts that had massive amounts of power, wisdom, and mysticism, mm -hmm. and coveted them, and brought them deep within the caverns of their libraries or their protective forces, mm -hmm. and said nobody should know about this because it would invalidate Christianity. Right. Yeah. And so the Vatican, to me, is a place of great... It's a landmark. Yes. Really, it's a really profound landmark. But if anybody watches the Borgias, you know, and goes in and sees what's it take to become a pope, right? Well, you can be a cardinal and have sex and have family and this, that, and the mm -hmm. other thing. That it's the story of the Vatican is different than the reality of the Vatican in its making. And I think it's very important for us to become aware of consciousness rather than fantasy. Yeah. So I'm glad that you could go there and be conscious rather than try to, to try to uphold the fantasy. Yeah. That's where we all are right now. That's where the story mm -hmm. really is right now. Mm -hmm. I don't want to live in the fantasy of my story anymore. Mm -hmm. I want to live in the reality of my story. Right. All of our stories. Right. And I think that's why so much healing is mm -hmm. necessary right now for mm -hmm. our souls and our consciousness. Yeah. And I, you know, I'll say this, that Tango just walked in the room, Bobby's here. Um, our bond is part of to bust the story mm -hmm. so that the soul can really be who it is, not what it was told to be. Right. Right. When <clears throat> we were, it was... When we were in the Church of the Stigmata, right. and we were all sitting in this little chapel, and Nikki Jorgensen was on the outside uh, taking photos, and Sister Angela, uh, who was just magnificent, and, and she was telling everyone that there is no way that you can separate yourself from the love of the Creator, because whatever the Creator has created has made the Creator very happy and glad. And she said, and that includes all of you. When the creator looked at you, when you were formed, the creator was full of joy. And the creator was very happy. And there isn't anything that you can do to take away the happiness and the joy of the creator. And that was a very moving moment. That was a holy moment. That was a sacred moment. Watching a woman who has taken a vow of of material poverty be so rich in the understanding of what her soul knows and sharing it with a very diverse group of people um, but again realizing that we were mystic travelers well in that moment Nikki came running into the chapel and she said Dana I just asked Sister Violet if I could take a photo of her and now Sister Violet wants to meet the person that that brought me here. And the look on Nikki's face was priceless. So I walked out of the chapel of the stigmata and here is this beautiful little, I believe she was a Dominican sister. And I took her hand and I said, Sister Violet, it is so nice to meet you. My name is Dana. And Nikki came here with me and she said, Dana, 
that group of people in the chapel, are is that your group, the group that came with you? And I said, that is the group that came with me. And she said, well, all I wanted to tell you was, from where I'm standing, I can feel the love of God in each and every one of them, and I just wanted to share that with you. And I said, they, they shine very brightly, don't they, sister? I said, their interior light is so bright, it fills the room. And she said, yes, exactly. They shine very brightly, and I just wanted to share that with you. That was a holy moment. That was a sacred how, moment. When you think of how many hundreds of thousands of people she sees. Yeah, exactly. To isolate your group. Yeah. Or, you know, the gathering of you and Minnie and to have the quality of something mm -hmm. be liberated yeah. from the dark. Yes, exactly. And, you know, by the time Sister Angela was done really uplifting everyone's spirit, um, there wasn't a dry eye in, in the chapel. And everyone's story changed in that moment. Those that were there in the Chapel of the Stigmata wondering if they were even worthy to be in a church, to be in a place of stigmata. You know, we all have our, our insecurities. In that moment, stories about several people just looking around the room changed. I am worthy. God does love me. God loves me no, even though I'm a lesbian, I'm a gay person, I'm a mystic, I'm agnostic, I'm atheist, I'm a recovering Catholic, I've never been a Catholic, don't like Catholics, God still loves me in this place. That's a yeah. holy moment. The Catholicism, Catholicism is only less than 2,000 years old. Right. We've been around for a lot longer than that. <laughs> Yes, we and have. I think it's important for us to remember that Catholicism is a young, organized religion yeah. that got created out of a political decision for taxes. If anybody really wants to go back and look at history, because Christianity was becoming popular, it's, it, it reminds me of being in Santa Barbara when chiropractics were illegal yeah. for the um, medical world mm -hmm. and that when chiropractics became a chosen practice by people that became popular, insurance companies said, we're missing out on validating chiropractics because if we insure them, then we'll make money. Yeah. And it's the same thing with Christianity. It was a financial decision on a city to tax people. And it wasn't just a God decision. It was a political decision. Yes. And so it's very important to be able to know that Christianity is young and that where you stepped and where you went to is so old. Mm -hmm. And it has many forms of belief and it has many stories of how to believe and it has many stories of our identities in our souls that allow us to feel our morphing with how I developed and even why possibly why I would have to go through Christianity as a choice karmically at some point, but not the only point. And to incorporate that, my, my dream, my story, my soul is intelligent enough to crisscross in the weeds, to braid into the psyche of all the different philosophies and all the different incarnations to know that I experience the existence of this world. Yes. Not just one story that says, if you believe in me, you exist. Right. Beautifully said. You know, it's interesting for me, Sandy, as you and I are, are talking tonight, I'm looking at all of the, you know, beautiful souls that are in the chat room. <clears throat> and I'm simultaneously thinking to myself, here's an example, Linda Claflin. Hi, Linda. <laughs> when I saw her name crop up, I remember the very first time that I met Linda and she gave me her very first wooden bowl that she had created. 
Oh my God, she's so good at that. Magnificent. It's in my dining room, as you know. Yeah. And so I think to myself, you know, going through all, looking at everyone and their names and the way they're contributing, I think to myself, what an amazing weave we have, Sand. And some of these people I've not ever met in person, but I've met them in the weave, in the ethers. My soul knows them. They're part of the beauty of my story. For however long they are in the story and maybe segue out or like Kelly Spencer, there was a little 35 year, you know, you go live your life, I'll live mine and then we'll come back together uh, <laughs> when we're supposed to be adults. And it's isn't it magnificent the story and the and the weaving of the story sand and the unweaving and the reweaving? I want to say that because we have the generosity of our lives being given to us to live, mm -hmm. we have some hindsight and wisdom to look back in our lives or upon our lives mm -hmm. with the story of our lives and go, "There's the weed. Yeah. Now it makes sense." Yes. There's the coming home. Fine. Yeah. On my 70th birthday, standing at the, the windows at the top of the mark and looking out at San Francisco, I saw something and I reflected in an energetic mysticism that made sense of the totality of my existence in a way that a calm came to me with the dominoes all from the beginning to that moment with it makes sense mm -hmm. because I'm standing at the pinnacle of something that San Francisco is so important to me but I can't live there mm -hmm. but I can be there mm -hmm. and to be there and turn 70 and know I had to respect that if I lived there I would not have had the life if I visited there and let my, lived my life, my life elsewhere. Sometimes we can't be where it is we think we're supposed to be because where we're meant to be is held together by where we think we're supposed to be. And I can visit where I think I'm supposed to be because it remembers me so dearly. Yes. And then it says... You are born here, and you need to leave here so that you can understand the universe, not just where you're created. And there's that beauty of, and I want to be able to honor, if a child dies three and a half seconds after it's born, yeah. it can still look at the totality of its existence mm -hmm. because its life is not just those nine months mm -hmm. or how many months right held in the womb mm -hmm. it has eons of stories yes. before it yes and it's about compassion not necessarily rationalization because we can't always rationalize why we have to feel so much pain exactly but we can have compassion for the moment of the story, and I think of Susie and Freddie when I say this, the compassion of their story is seven years in the love story, but their whole life in the loving story. And when we make an agreement with someone to say, I'm going to love you until the end of time, right. we never know what that time is. That's right. And that's the story of that moment. That's right. And then the rest of the story continues. And for you to go to such, and I want to say this from the way that I viewed it through Facebook, because I would look at those photographs, and I've seen those photographs how many hundreds of thousands of times through books or through stories that were on video or movies, this, that, and the other thing, or through studying history. But to have you send out, or David send out, or Nikki send out, or anybody that was sending out the Facebook, here it is, here it is, here it is. Mm -hmm. It was intimate. 
it was personal. It was no longer a book on my lap. It was no longer a movie over there. It was no longer an assumption. It was a beloved walking the stone that we walked upon, bringing me back to where I loved. And reminding me of a story that may be starting again. And I see in you, even now that we talk, that something is so done. Yeah. There's so many stories. Yes. And that going on these stones, going and touching these pillars, going and being a part of the ancientness, that you get to continue a story now in a way that your soul is living, mm -hmm. not the debts you may have needed to pay to other souls and their stories of you. And <laughs> yours right now. So there's a whole new story. Thank you for doing that. And so it begins again. It continues, as Bobby was saying. Yeah. So with that, Sandy, our 90-minute show is complete. And... Yeah. Um, Cindy Lynn, who, who views our shows and listens in, it appears that you and I get to meet her at ordination graduation in November. Yay! That will be great fun to finally get to see her face. I remember the first time I saw Lady Hawk, <laughs> uh, Catherine Harrison, it was like, wow. Um, Harley, wait! I'm yeah. on my turn! <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so how wonderful. And, you know, while we have this opportunity... I just want to personally say to everyone, thank you. Thank you for not only being a part of the story, but for sharing your story. Yeah. Making room for me in your story. Yeah. And, um, and I'm very sincere about that. Yeah. There's a humility in knowing that our stories collaborate in the weave, in the braid, in mm -hmm. the grace, and in the allowing the disgrace to be eliminated. Yeah. From any place in your story that defiled you from the beauty of who you are. Welcome next. I love you because <laughs> of so many things. And... Um, Maybe we'll do that at part of the ordination, huh? I love you. Everybody should experience I love you because. With that, everyone, we love you because. Because you, you are who you are and who you continue to be. So with that, Sandy, good night, my dear, my dear friend, my love. And um, it's with a grateful heart. Because. <laughs> good night, everyone. Blessings be. Bye, everybody.